So, Revelation chapter number 20 is where we're at. And it won't be long. We'll be back at chapter number one. <laughs> with, with the way we're, we're doing it. But just sort of hitting some of the highlights. And today we're going to talk about heaven on earth. You know, there's this there's this gentleman. He he uh, was getting older. And he was starting to forget things and, and stuff. And he found out that there was this brain procedure where they could inject brain matter from someone else into your brain. He said, well, I think I'd like to have that. And so he, he went over and he, he sat there with the doctors and they went through everything. And they said, I, I believe you'll be a good candidate. He said, but what we've got to do is decide what brain matter you want. He said, now, we've got this engineer brain matter. The guy, you know, was mechanically minded and good brain, uh, well used uh, and everything. And it is $500 an ounce. And we, we give you that. He said, well, that sounds good. He said, what else? He said, well, we got this lawyer's brain. And it's sort of a little conniving and scheming and uh, things like that. It's been used a lot. Uh, but we have that. And this, it's $1,000 an ounce. It's okay. He said, or we got a doctor's brain. He said, got all the medical knowledge and, and everything. Now, it's $2,000 an ounce. He says, that's good. He says, is there anything else? Well, yeah, we got one more. And he walked them over to one, and it was had a little uh, cape over it. And he said, now this one here. Pretty expensive. Is it two hundred fifty thousand dollars an ounce? The whisper he said, you know, "It's the brain of a politician." <laughs> he said, "The brain of a politician." He said, "Almost a quarter of a million dollars." He said, "Why?" He said, "Well, one, it's, it's very seldom used." <laughs> he said, "Secondly, he said, do you know how many politicians it takes to get one ounce of brain?" <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's that's why it was so expensive. Because it takes a lot of politicians to get one ounce of brain. And I think that fits in good with our uh, society right now, where we're at. Um, we 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 tend to blame everything on politicians, but we also expect that they can fix everybody. Uh, it's not really the politicians' problem as much as it is ours in the churches. And one, it's ours because we're the ones that puts the idiots in there. Yeah. And so it's, it's really hard to say that. But there's coming a time and there is going to be an era of righteousness that is going to come. Um, and that, that day's coming. And that's what we're going to read about. Uh, Isaiah tells us about it. Daniel tells us about it. It's uh, the final kingdom of our Lord. A world without war. A world where all things are fair. There'll be no illness. There'll, there'll be no need for universal health care. We'll have it. It's called God. Because there'll be no illness. There'll be no need of um, save the children, feed the children. Because in this world, there'll be no hunger. And there'll be no need to go and see Greece at the theater that talks about rebellion because... We're not going to need entertainment because we're not going to be bored. It's going to be a, a very exciting time. And that's the millennial reign of Christ on this earth. 
Now, this is heaven on earth. John Walford said this, very few verses in the Bible are more critical to the interpretation of the Bible as a whole than the opening verses of Revelation chapter 20. Um, and I, I agree with them there. These few verses here are very relevant to the interpretation of the Bible. I've always, I've said it, and I made the statement years ago, I never heard anybody else ever say it, but that our eschatology determines our theology. And I believe that. I believe what we believe about the end time events will determine what we believe about God and who God is. They go hand in hand. And in Revelation chapter 20, in verse number 1, we're going to read down to verse number 6. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan bound him a thousand years. Now, this comes right after the battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Amen. Says, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, it's hard for me to understand that he must be loose a little season, but there's a reason. God's got that. And, uh, and, and we'll know that reason. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and are in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I'm going to read verse 7, a part of it. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. I think he's going to be mad about that time. <laughs> when he's loosed out of his prison for a thousand years because he, that would be the first time he's ever been really bound other than when he was bound from being able to go back to heaven. When he was kicked out of heaven, mm -hmm. you saw what happened from that from the seven-year tribulation period. Uh, the last part of it when he was banned and the abomination of desolation became, and that's when we saw a great thing happen. Now, the stint of this time, of this heaven on earth, is a thousand years. The phrase is used six times in this passage. A thousand years. That's, how, that's where we get the word millennium. Millennium is a thousand um, is years. And you put them together, millennium, and it's the reign of Christ on earth. Now, other terms for the millennium have been used throughout the Bible is the regeneration and Matthew. We have the times of refreshing and acts and times of restoration. Different other phrases have been used uh, for the term millennium. Um, it begins with, and I, I want you to understand how the millennium begins. The millennium begins with incarceration of the devil. Mm -hmm. That's really the beginning of the millennium, is when the devil is incarcerated. 
The earth is finally set free because the devil is bound. That's what starts the millennium. you got to understand that this earth has been bound because of Satan and his influence and his power and all the, the things that have happened. And so Satan will be thrown in jail by an angel. I don't know what angel. Uh, I, I would think possibly Michael. Michael has wrestled with them before. But this time Michael has something. You know what he has this time? He has authority that he hadn't had before. Because look at verse number 1, chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Not a key. What the Bible says, the key. A special key. Mm -hmm. And that key is authority. Keys show authority. When you got a key to a place, it shows you have the authority to enter that place. It shows that you have authority over that place when you have the key. If, 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 you were to get to your house and somebody said, uh, I don't think this is your house. I've got the key right here. I don't believe you. Well, let me show you. And I put the key in and I turn the lock and the door opens. What would tell you this is not my house now? I have the key to it. And, and to me, what is the greatest thing that you have to your house, to your car? Whatever it is, you have authority over that. You can't start a car without a key. Well, some people can, but, you know. Uh, some of you just got pushed, but you got to have a fob, you know. Uh, that's key. But you, you've got to have a key. That key shows authority. And, and so to me, here, this angel comes down with authority. And only that, he's got a chain. I don't think it's any... Just regular chain. I think it's a special chain. It's a chain that had been forged maybe by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a great chain. And it's just not any kind of chain. And he's at this chain. And so this angel has the authority. He has the key. And therefore, he's about to incarcerate this person. Then this millennium starts because there's an administration that's in place. We find here, in verse number four, I saw thrones, and they that sit upon it, and judgments were given unto them. In other words, there's a group of individuals who are on thrones who are now going to be over this world and so now the administration has changed. The same political power is no longer involved. They're no longer in charge. There's new political power. And, and you know, who, who are these this groups of people on thrones? Well, it could be many, a few, uh, many different groups. Um... We know that there's tribulation believers who were killed, who were beheaded during that, who refused to take the mark of the beast, that they're going to be there. We know there's Old Testament believers, such as Daniel and others like that, who had been promised that they would rule and reign. Jesus' apostles were also given authority that they would rule and reign over the 12 tribes of Judah. I mean, 12 tribes of Israel one day. So they're going to be there. They're going to have to the phone. And then all New Testament believers have been told that we're going to rule and reign. I don't know who is particular of these thrones. But there's a, there's a group of people. It could be. We will rule with God on this restored earth for 1,000 years. I was thinking about that. 
and uh, I, I, I want to rule up in Virginia in the Shadow Valley. That's where I want to be. That was probably one of the most beautiful places I, I remember going and being at during my travels with neighborhood Bible time. I didn't get to do a lot of sightseeing. It wasn't a sightseeing tour. It was a working tour. We didn't have time for sightseeing. Uh, uh, every now and then, we were able to have a little bit of time to go somewhere. And I remember driving through the Shadow Valley when I was up in Virginia. And I enjoyed that. That would be a good place. Brother Lee, he might be the ruler of rain over in Tennessee. In a little Crossville, Tennessee, the rule and reign of Don and Mr. and Mrs. Lee over there. I don't know where it's going to be. Uh, you might have fantasies of being somewhere else to rule and reign. Uh, but, but we're going to do it. And you're going to be somewhere where you're going to rule and reign. Now, there's an explanation here that is deserved about this thousand years is it a literal thousand years <laughs> well it's only told us about four times these few verses mm -hmm. it says um, here that um, in verse number two it says bound him a thousand years then you go down to verse three uh, see the nation no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Then you go to uh, verse number four and it says uh, in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Then you go down to verse number five and the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And then you go down to verse number six, and it says, and, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hmm. You, you think it's going to be 2,000, Brother Lee? I think it's going to be a thousand years. Now, people will say, and they won't say, well, do you believe that's going to be a literal 2,000 years? <coughs> well, I do. I, I do. 365 and a quarter days each year, with one being leap year. This year will be our leap year coming up. And, and so I believe that. I believe that's the way it's going to be. Uh, I, I, I believe if you don't believe that, then the, you you got to then come back and say, well, when he talks about there being two witnesses, does he literally mean two? When he talks about seven churches, was it really eight? When he talks about seven years, did he mean 14? When he talks about there were seven trumpets, why not eight? You see, either you're going to take it literally or not. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're not going to take it literally, then when do you draw the line? And I believe in a literal interpretation of the Word of God. And, and I believe it's like a literal thousand years, just like I believe all these other things are literal. Now, that thousand years has other viewpoints. If you read the Bible from cover to cover and you look at it in a literal form, I believe you're going to come out with a viewpoint that is considered to be premillennial. Premillennial viewpoint says that Jesus will come back before the millennium. That he reigns for a thousand years on the throne of David. And primary view of the church for the first three centuries. That was the primary view. Mm -hmm. 
That's what most of our ancient fathers held to. And I believe it's the most literal view of the Bible. They do have other views. You've got the post-millennial view. The post-millennial view is that Jesus will come back after the millennium. In other words, Jesus will come after a golden age that the church will begin. In other words, we will gospelize the entire world and the world will get better and better and better and once it gets good enough, Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom. And we're actually going to help usher in the millennium because things are going to get so much better. Now that view was held very much in the early 1900s. It sort of died off with the onset of such calamities as World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. But it has begun to come back again. And now the church has began to embrace this theology once again. And they call it the dominion theology or the kingdom theology. That's why you hear people talk about the kingdom. And that the church will take dominion over the earth and institute and bring in righteousness to the earth and usher in to the kingdom. And that is uh, the new thinking. That's the one that the amillennials have really taken more to. Because the amillennial view is there really is not a millennium. Mm -hmm. That it is the kingdom now. Is that is, is the church age is the kingdom and that the church is spiritual Israel there's really not a Israel but the church is the spiritual Israel of the Bible and that this is about as good as going to get but the millennials decided they didn't really like that and so now the millennials have reinstituted and began to move their philosophy and their theology more into this kingdom age that you're beginning to see come forth into our churches. You, you hear even a lot of good preachers who talk about kingdom age. One of the biggest ones that loves to talk about the kingdom age and I love his preaching is Tony Evans from out in Texas and he's a great preacher but his kingdom philosophy this dominion philosophy and theology is beginning to overtake and a lot of our Southern Baptist churches have began to take on this kingdom philosophy a lot of the Pentecostal churches have began to take on this kingdom philosophy, this dominion. And to me, it is a movement from amillennialism into postmillennialism. And it's a combination of both of them moving together. And, and so I don't know what you're going to call it, ah, postmillennial. Uh, I, I don't know, but there there's really no other way to interpret the Bible letter than, rather than literal. The, the problem comes is God uses very exact numbers in the Bible. And if we do not believe in the Bible literally, then who will tell you actually what it means? Somebody's got to tell you. Based on what? Whatever they think. Whatever you feel. That's why I believe the Bible literally. Literally what it says and, and, and what it's all about. 
Now, what would the world look like without Satan? Well, peace and not war. We talk a lot about peace today. We, we, we have Nobel Peace Prize. We have peace groups. People throw up the peace sign. And there's a lot of stuff that talks about peace. But there's no such thing. But there will be peace on the earth, finally. The animal kingdom will be tamed. The Bible tells us that Kids will be state friendly. Snakes will be kids friendly. And that a wolf will wait, lay down with a, a lamb and get up fully clothed, not eaten. <laughs> and, 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 and now if you say, well, the animal kingdom's already tamed. No, they're not. Why do you think we have zoos? You can't just walk into the zoo with all the gates open. If, if, if you knew today that you go to Atlantic Zoo and they said, hey, we're having a special day today, it's open door day. All the doors to all the cages are going to be open and it's free for anybody who wants to come. Are you going? <laughs> I'm not going. I, I am not going at all. Uh, but in the millennium, you could. Mm -hmm. And none of those animals would bother you. The, the biosphere will be lush again. Turn, turn to Isaiah chapter 35. Let's give you some Bible. Again, it's not my opinion. It's what the Bible says. And, and I, I'm a literal interpretation. I believe in literal inter interpretation of the Bible. Look at Isaiah 35, verse number 1. The wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them. And the deserts shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon, of Lebanon shall be given unto it the excellencies of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the land and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God, with a recompense, he will come and save you. In other words, everything's going to be much better. Disabilities are going to be healed. Look at verse number five. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the wilderness shall water break out, and streams in the desert. Boy, what glory the world is going to have. As the biosphere is all of a sudden correcting itself. Disabilities are leaving. Look at Isaiah Chapter 65. Verse number 20. Thou shalt be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be cursed. In other words, if you're a hundred years old, you're just a child. But by the time you reach a hundred, you ought to at least have come to the place that you're no longer following after your sins if you accepted the Savior. 
Because there will be people during this time that will refuse him. During the millennial, though Satan is no longer living, human nature is still what it is. That's why the Bible tells us God's going to rule with an iron fist. Because we will have perfect bodies, but there's going to be some here that don't have a perfect body. Total perfect body. Their bodies are going to be better. Because earth is going to be better. They're not going to have the illness and, and all that. And because of that, some are going to be puffed up with pride and decide they don't need a God. They just needed the earth to finally heal itself. And they'll rebel against God. And I believe the biggest rebelling will be because of pride. What was the rebellion that Satan had? Was that a pride? Because there's not going to be war. There's not going to be any of that kind of stuff. But these people who have lived all these years now will have been built up with pride and believing, hey, I can be a God now. Because there will be, they'll have strength. They'll have, think about these people who haven't lived that long and their minds having been fully activated. You've you, you got to think, man's mind at that time is going to be more active than it's ever been, Brother Lee. Mm -hmm. Think of all the inventions and all the things that are going to be happening on this earth. Mm -hmm. When there's no roses that have thorns. We, we talk about that song, Joy to the world. And let me, and and I told you that it really is not a song about um, Christmas. It's really a song about four twenty three. It's it's really a song about the millennium. And I, I want to read you the last verse. He rules the world. With truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love. But then he also goes in here, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found. That's all going to be gone. The curse and all those things are going to be gone. And so because of that, man's going to live longer. He's going to feel better. And he's going to get more prideful. Mm -hmm. But then there's an essentiality that comes into play in this, a necessity. Look at verse number 3 of Revelation chapter 20. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed. The millennium is necessary. You know what's necessary? To redeem creation from judgment. In one sense. You got to think about it. There's been a curse on this earth since G Genesis chapter 3. And then the earth has really been trashed during the tribulation period mm -hmm. by God, by the devil, and by man. I tell you what, these tree huggers. I'm not going to like the tribulation period. They're not going to like what's going to happen to this earth during this time. But God's going to make it all beautiful again. But it's not going to come instantly. Now, there'll be some things that will be instantaneous. But I believe it's going to take time for it to heal.
the earth to rejuvenate and to cover and recover. I don't think God's going to snap his finger and it does it just automatic. I think there's some things will be that way. I think the animals will be that way. The biosphere will be that way. But I think there's going to be a lot of other things because the Bible tells us that the swords are going to be pounded into plow tears. Now, God can do that like that and make all the equipment, but it's not going to be made just like that, is it? Somebody's got to take those swords and pound them. God still believes there's work. Man will work during that time, but he will not toil during that time. He'll be able to work. Can you imagine being in your fleshly body, Brother Lee, and going to work and working all day and coming home and not being tired? That's going to happen during that time for fleshly bodies. One of the reasons we're going to rule and reign is because it's going to be different, folks. And I think we don't think of that sometimes. You think of the pride that's going to come upon mankind during the, the millennial reign when he's got brain function, he's got physical bodies, that are not feeling the harm and things. He's not as tired. I think there's going to be some tiredness, but there's going to be a recovery so quick from it. And all these things that are happening, he's going to be built up with pride like he's never been before. And the biggest sin during this time is going to be a sin that is not seen. Because it's inside. It's in the heart. It's a sin of pride. I really believe that could be the part. Now, I don't have biblical reasons. That's more chemology there. But look at what's happening. Look at mankind. The devil's not there. We're ruling and reigning. I don't think there's going to be enormous sinful things happening. During the millennial reign. Huh? He's dealt with immediately. So what's going to cause these people to leave God and follow Satan? If it's not pride. If it's not pride. You see, pride is just the beginning isn't it, of sin. Once they then decide, because how does a person get saved? By really chunking their pride. What's going to keep these people from getting saved? Their pride. And because of their pride, they'll follow the wrong one once again, just as man has throughout all these thousands of years. And it all comes down to pride. Now, I, I can't say that's what the Bible says here. I'm just putting myself in that situation where man is and what's going on and what's happening and this is the conclusion that I can come to. Now, I haven't read that from anybody's books or anything. This is total 100% chemology. So, believe me, don't believe me. It's not matter. You'll know one of these days. Uh, but God will make the earth beautiful. The kingdom will come as we have asked. The millennium is necessary to fulfill all the promises God made to the nation of Israel. That a covenant with David and when the millennium is over, the earth will be completely destroyed. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I don't know if it's completely destroyed or remade. I think it's remade and it'll be really the the I'm going to say fourth remaking of the world or so. Because it was made once and I think was destroyed. And then in Genesis 1, 2, it was made over again. And then, to me, it, the earth was remade over after the flood. And it's going to be remade over again. It, it was really remade over a little bit after Armageddon, but not totally.
But I believe this is going to be a complete remaking of the world and of the earth. And there's going to be a new Jerusalem. All these things are going to happen. And if you're a believer, my question is, what is your relationship to what Jesus told you in the Sermon of Mount? Are you pursuing a life that is dominated by God who rules over us and the thing, other question is, if you're an unbeliever, will you be a part of his kingdom? You can be. By accepting him. Accept him as your Lord. You'll be part of his kingdom. You won't be a king, you'll be a Lord. But you can join him in his earthly kingdom. But there is something more. We really were made for a different world than the world we are in right now. We were made for a different world. And one day we're going to be in that different world. And understand that eternity has phases. And that the millennium is only just one of the phases of eternity. The millennium is not eternity. People won't say, oh, that's the way it's going to be. Oh, no, that's just a thousand years. That's just one of the phases of eternity. And, and eternity has different phases. And, and that's our phase that we know of. We don't know the rest of it. I, we, we really have no idea what God's got in store for us for all eternity. But Boy, if it's better than the millennium, that's going to be pretty good. So even after the millennium, there's going to be one more fight, and that's the battle of God and Magog. And that's when the devil is put to rest for eternity. And then we begin another phase of eternity. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that, that's just exciting when you begin to think about it. People get scared about this kind of stuff. I don't. I used to. But I know which camp I'm in. I know which side I'm on. And I already know that my side wins. And the thing is, the devil knows it too. He just don't want to accept it. You know why he won't accept it? Pride. Pride. He still thinks he can win. He's gonna been he's released. He still thinks he can win again. And he's gonna deceive many for a season. And he'll do his best. But then eventually he's put to rest. What a wonderful time that's gonna be. And I hope that. If you're saved, you're prepared and ready. I hope if you're not saved that you become a believer and you'll believe in Christ and accept him as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. Lord, we won't say we love you. Thank you for giving us a glimpse into this phase of eternity and of what it brings for us. And we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name.